Uh, I'm really pleased to be here, and I'd like to admit straight away uh, what my, my rationale is for giving you this presentation. And my rationale is really a, really a very simple one. My rationale is that I'm both a student of history uh, and also a student of the scriptures. And I think that the two uh, are, are, are very reconcilable. The two can be married uh, when you're a Bible student by looking at the history of our times, the times that, that we're experiencing now, particularly with regard to Israel and the Middle East. So that's why we've called this presentation 70 Years On, Endless Contending, because that's really the story of Israel, isn't it? Endless Contending, 1948. So we're going to really start here where Jeff finished earlier on. Um, we're going to start with the early struggle that Israel had to establish its homeland and the continuing pursuit of peace that has been just within its grasp, but never quite within its grasp uh, at certain times during the last 70 years. And I think the place to start our presentation this afternoon is when everything changed. And everything changed on the 3rd of September, 1939. This is when Adolf Hitler invaded Poland and the Second World War started. So in 1939, World War again for the second time in the 20th century. And everything really changed as far as the Jews are concerned. If our perspective is on the Jews, and it is on the Jews this afternoon, really that is what changed everything for the Jews. They were already, or many of them were already in Palestine. But the vast majority of the Jews lived in Europe, and most particularly in Eastern Europe. And we all know the story, I think, of the Holocaust. And this is really what changed everything as far as the majority of the Jews of the world's um, focus on Israel is concerned. Because their focus on this state that they hadn't yet grasped, this state that was not yet theirs, their focus on this place, Palestine, changed as a result of the Holocaust. And I think that um, this historian here, Paul Johnson, uh, in a, a book he wrote in the 80s called The History of the Jews, puts it really well. And it's about why uh, the vast majority of the world's Jews' attitude towards Palestine changed because of the Holocaust. Now, as you've heard in the first part uh, of our, our talks this afternoon, uh, the British gained control after the First World War of Palestine. And they started to encourage immigration from the Jewish people of Europe. And so there was a trickle at first, and that increased in numbers as the 20s went into the 1930s, and the 1930s went into the Second World War. So there was quite a, a large body of Jewish people that was already in Palestine when the Second World War broke out, as well as the indigenous people of Palestine, the Arab people that had lived there before. So in the First World War, the Balfour Declaration was made. I think Jeff touched on that briefly. And the First World War really made the conceptual state of Israel a possibility. The First World War made this new Zionist state where, where Jews could live a possibility. A Jewish homeland became a possibility after the First World War. It was the Second World War that changed everything. The Second World War made a Jewish homeland absolutely essential for the Jews. It's something that they had to have. It's something that they could not be denied. And the reason for that is very simple. It's the Holocaust. Because the Holocaust, the Second World War, the Holocaust persuaded the overwhelming majority of Jewish people that this homeland, this state, had to be created. And it had to be made secure. Whatever the cost to themselves or to anybody else, they had to have their own homeland. They could trust no one else. Who would come to the defense of the Jews during the Holocaust? Almost nobody. No states, just individual people scattered throughout Europe came to their help. No state came to the help of the Jews. The six million Jews that perished in the Holocaust. So they had to have their own homeland. It was an essential thing. Meanwhile, the, the mandate, the control that Britain had been given over Palestine at the end of the First World War was coming to an end. They were granted the mandate in, in 1922, and they, they continued to govern Palestine until 1948, until just after the, the Second World War. But by that time, Palestine had become ungovernable. 
They just couldn't keep control of this unending faction between uh, uh, the, the Arabs and the Jews in Palestine. So Britain was to leave everything to the United Nations in 1948. And I think that that picture there of those, uh, those uh, British soldiers carrying a coffin of, uh, of one of their, uh, their fellow soldiers that is being killed by a, a Palestinian terrorist is a very telling photograph because it really tells a story of failure in Palestine. So the British failed to keep control of Palestine and the United Nations took over. And by the way, in the Second World War, a lot of the Jews of Palestine, the young men of Palestine, fought in the British Army. Here you see uh, a photograph of the, uh, the Jewish Brigade in the Second World War fighting against the Nazis, particularly in North Africa. But as far as Palestine was concerned, with these, these two camps, the Jewish immigrants, mainly from Europe, from Poland, from Russia, from other parts of Europe, and on the other side, the Arabs, they were really uh, set apart with differences that they just couldn't solve. And the British couldn't solve them either. And there's a, a brief recapitulation on this slide of what those irreconcilable differences were. Now, this is during the time of the, the end of the mandate. We're coming now to just before 1948, when Israel became an independent sovereign state. So on the one side you've got the Palestinian Arabs, and on the other side you've got the Zionists, the Jews, the Jews of Israel, the Jews of Palestine. As far as the Arabs were concerned, no immigration, no further immigration as far as the Jews were concerned. We have to encourage our people to emigrate into Palestine. After all, there's so many survivors, there's so many displaced people from the Second World War that need to come to this homeland. So you've got one side saying no immigration, the other side saying we need to continue to have our Jews coming into Palestine. From the, the Palestinian Arabs, you, you see that, that their demand is for our own independent Arab state of Palestine. It's going to be our state. Well, of course, the Zionists wanted a Jewish homeland. So you've again got this, 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 this conflict going on here, this tension going on there. The British thought that you could partition Palestine. So there was a, a, one of the commissions in the 1930s was called the, uh, the Peel Commission, and it came out from London uh, to the, the Mandate of Palestine, and it decided that, well, you can't really reconcile these, these, these two camps, so let's divide it. Let's have a partition. And Britain had done that in Ireland 20 years before, when they'd, they'd granted uh, independence to the South, the mainly Catholic South, but the North, the Protestant North, was still separated from the South. There was a partition there. And they thought that the same thing might work in Palestine. Well, as far as the Palestinians were concerned, the Palestinian Arabs, no partition. Uh, they would not accept a partition under any circumstances. The land had to be theirs. That was very clear. The Zionists, on the other hand, the Jews, would have accepted a partition. Uh, reluctantly, they would have accepted it. So, again, you have this tension that was not solved. So when we're coming to this... This period, we're now inching towards 1948, and we're coming to uh, the end of the British Mandate in Palestine. Now, in the Second World War, there was a, a very important series of battles that was fought in North Africa between uh, Rommel and the, the German army, and between Montgomery, uh, who is the leader of the, uh, uh, the North African uh, army of the, uh, the Allies. And if Rommel had won, Palestine would have been under threat. And the Jews of Palestine would have been under the same sort of threat as the devastation that they were already experiencing under the Nazis in Europe. But by 1942, that threat was receding because Montgomery and the Allies were starting to win those battles in North Africa. So the, the military threat to Palestine was receding. In 1942 also, the Holocaust, this, this genocide, this mass uh, uh, slaughter, this industrialized scale slaughter of the Jews of Europe was starting to come to the public's attention. So in the second or third year of the, uh, the Second World War, uh, people are starting to become aware uh, amongst the Allies that these terrible things are happening in Eastern Europe. In 1942 also, for the first time, the, the, the World Zionist Organization, so those that were trying to develop uh, uh, Palestine as a homeland for the Jews, came out and said it. We want independence for the Jews in Palestine. 
So in 1942, at a, a conference in Bildimore in, uh, in Canada, uh, this, this declaration was made. We, we need to have this for the Jews. We need to have Palestine for the Jews. Now, we often associate terrorism with the Arab camp, don't we? But there's also terrorism, and it started during the Second World War in Palestine from some of the, the uh, Jewish factions, particularly the, the Irgun and the, uh, the Stern Gang. And there was an escalation of violence by Jewish terrorists, too, against Palestine. There was reprisals against Palestinian uh, guerrilla attacks uh, on their kibbutzes and farms. And so this violence was, was really not just, not just perpetuating, but escalating uh, during the Second World War. In fact, there were uh, assassinations of uh, some of the British officials uh, that governed the mandate of Palestine. There's a photograph here during those, those late years uh, of the mandate of what it was like to be a British soldier trying to keep control of Palestine between these two irreconcilable and increasingly uh, violent uh, uh, camps, opposing camps, the Palestinian Arabs on the one side and the Jewish settlers on the other. There's a photograph here of uh, 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 Arab protesters uh, protesting uh, against continual uh, Jewish uh, enroachment on what they see as their country. And uh, another photograph here during this same period, we're in the 1940s, is of uh, Jewish terrorism. Uh, there's a, a British police station uh, in Palestine that's been bombed by uh, the Irgun, the, uh, the Jewish terrorist organization. And uh, there's perhaps the worst one uh, of all of the, uh, um, uh, the outrages that uh, the Jewish terrorists perpetuated uh, during the last period of the British Mandate, and that's the King David Hotel in Jerusalem, which was uh, blown up with, uh, with great loss of life, um, including Jewish lives, by the way. So we're coming now right to the end of the mandatory period. Uh, we've come to the end of the Second World War. Uh, there's a, an increased desperation amongst the Jews that they've got to have their own country, their own state, their own sovereign state, their own homeland. And so really, the writing's on the wall. Uh, Britain has lost control of the mandate, uh, and increasing numbers of displaced people, Jewish people that have survived the concentration camps and the death camps of the Nazis, an increasing number of these people now is pouring into Palestine. And there's a, a famous photograph of, uh, of one of the ships that is bringing uh, these, these uh, uh, survivors from uh, the Nazi Holocaust to Palestine. And so in May 1948, just over 70 years ago, the state of Israel was born. And it was a cause, as we'll see in a minute, for enormous rejoicing amongst Jews all over the world. And we're going to focus on one particular story that I think will interest you about the Jews of Russia. So Israel's born in May 1948. But of course, let's not forget that there's also a people in Palestine that want Palestine for them, for the Arabs. And there's a postage stamp, I think it's an Egyptian stamp actually, from that period, Palestine for the Arabs. So that tension that's been there all along during the mandatory period, when the British controlled Palestine, is still there and it's going to cause a war as soon as Israel declares its independence in May of 1948. What actually happened? The very day that uh, independence was declared, or the following morning, the Arab League, so that's a, uh, a, a, a group of uh, Arab countries, Egypt, Jordan, Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, uh, combined to wipe Israel and its Jews off the face of the map. And there's a quotation I've put there by the, uh, the Arab League Secretary General, who said at the time, this will be a war of extermination and a momentous massacre, which will be spoken of like the Mongolian massacres and the Crusades. We will sweep them into the sea. Now, I think that this statement of intent hasn't gone away. And I think, I think that even today, there are groupings that we can recognize in today's Arab world that would wish to do the same to the people of Israel, to the Jews of Israel. And that, that war of independence 
1948 to 1949, was, was won. And it was overwhelmingly uh, a victory for the, for the Jews of Israel. And on the other side, it was regarded as a great disaster. The Palestinians and the Arabs to this day call that, uh, that, that uh, uh, defeat that they suffered during the, the War of Independence, as the Israelis call it, they call it Al-Nakba, the disaster. And uh, it's a contested history between the two camps today. There's a very different story that you'll hear from the Palestinians that you will hear from uh, Israeli historians. It's a contested history. But the outcome of Al-Nakba, the disaster, was refugees. In 1949, there were 700,000 refugees, Arab refugees, that left Palestine. As you can see, uh, 350,000 settled in Jordan, uh, just uh, uh, on the, the other side of the, uh, the Jordan River. Uh, 200,000 were in the, the Gaza Strip, which belonged to Egypt at the time. Another 100,000 uh, went north, uh, and another 60-odd thousand uh, went to uh, Syria uh, as refugees. The Arab side of the story is that they were forced out by the Jews. The Jewish side of the story is that they left voluntarily, or most of them left voluntarily. Only some of them were forced out by the uh, Israeli army. And that they were encouraged to, to leave by the uh, Arab states that invaded Israel. So a very contested uh, history of uh, the victory on the one side and al-Nakba on the other side. What we really had... What we really have since that very time, since the, the War of Independence, since Al-Nakba, is we've got arbitrary borders. The borders are never clear. And during those early years of the State of Israel, there were so many border clashes. Between 1949 and 1956, so that's between the War of Independence and what became known as the Suez Crisis in 1956, there were tens of thousands of incursions across the border of Israel uh, by uh, Arab fighters, they called themselves Fayadin, self-sacrificers, and they were prepared to fight to the death. They were prepared to sacrifice their life in the cause of Arab nationalism. Not much has changed. There was harsh retaliation by the uh, Israeli border patrols and the Israeli army. And that led, in 1956, to the Suez Crisis. The Suez Crisis was a, an invasion of the Suez Canal by the, the combined military forces of Britain and France. And it was really one of the last colonial wars where they were trying to keep territory under their control. And Israel joined Britain and France uh, in a war against Egypt. It was called the Sinai War. And there's a, uh, the result of the war in 1956, where uh, uh, finally the United States uh, uh, forced a peace on the two contesting parties, on Egypt and the Arabs on the one side, and on France and Britain and Israel on the other. And so you had a, a fragile peace that came out of this crisis. And by the way, this was a world crisis in 1956. This was a really serious crisis. And some of the older ones here will no doubt remember uh, 1956, the Suez Crisis. Uh, these uh, two lovely people that have just come into the room now, they certainly will remember 1956. Uh, and we'll just... Uh, let them take their seats. Because 1956 was a time when also uh, the oil taps of the world uh, were, were almost turned off. So the Western world was, was very focused on what was happening in the Arab countries of the Middle East that controlled the world's, or most of the world's oil supply at that time. So what were the consequences of this Suez crisis, of this Sinai war in 1956? Well, the first thing I think that's really notable is that the two powers which had been the predominant powers in the Middle East since the First World War, so for over 50 years, uh, they were really in decline now. France and Britain now uh, suffered a huge decline in their prestige. They were no longer the big players in the background in the Middle East. America was now the great player in the Middle East from the one side, and Russia, increasingly, or the Soviet Union, was the great power that was pulling the strings from the other side as we uh, move on from the Suez Crisis. Another thing that happened in the, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the pro-United Kingdom parts of the Arab uh, 
uh, world was that there were, uh, there were coup d'etats, there were uh, overthrows of governments uh, in countries like Iraq and Jordan that were regarded by the Arab world as having been too close to the, the fading power of Great Britain. And there was a, uh, a leader, President Nasser, uh, Gamal Nasser, uh, who also uh, grew in stature. So Nasser became now uh, a, a huge symbol to the Arab world of Arab independence. We can do it. We can be world players. So Nasser became a huge figure as a, as a result of the Suez crisis. But really, in the overall scheme of things, nothing really changed in 1956. It was really the same tensions, the same irreconcilable differences between the two camps that we'd seen since the First World War, since the early days of the British Mandate. So nothing really had changed in the overall scheme of things. And this is a, a, a very uh, convoluted uh, but potted history that I'm giving you. It's a very, very shortened history of the times that I'm giving you this afternoon. So please do excuse me as I, I rush through these events because a lot happened in between. But we'd still be here next week if we went into too much detail. So I'm going to now jump to 1967. So we're jumping from 1956, continued conflict, continued tensions, uh, continued violence between uh, Israel and the, uh, the Arab uh, 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 um, terrorists and irregulars that are infiltrating all of the time. So there's continued violence happening in the years between 1956 and 1967. And in 1967, we come to the, uh, uh, the so-called Six-Day War. The Six-Day War was an overwhelming victory for Israel against the Arab states surrounding it. Uh, for instance, the, the Egyptian Air Force was, was wiped out in the first hours of the first day of the war. So there's some pictures of the, uh, the Mirage jets uh, that, uh, that destroyed, uh, first of all, the Egyptian and afterwards the Syrian Air Force. And on the ground, too, it was a series of overwhelming victories for the Israeli army. What really came out of that war, that six-day war, was that Israel was now expanded. Its borders were more secure. Uh, Jerusalem was no longer divided because they, they conquered the part of, of Jerusalem that had been still in Arab hands. But the thing also that we should remember, even though it was an overwhelming uh, victory for the, uh, for the Israelis, is there was no treaty. There was no agreement. There was, no, uh, there was nothing more than a ceasefire between the, the two factions. We jump forward uh, uh, some more years here to 1973, another war, uh, the Yom Kippur War. And this was a war that took Israel by surprise in 1973. And it was really much more closely fought than the previous war in 1967 had been. It's still Israel against the Arab states that surround it. And in the end, peace is negotiated, but there's really some outcomes there. The Arabs lost again, but Israel's confidence... Israel's confidence that she could always uh, overwhelmingly defeat any armies that came against it was really starting to erode. So the time now was, was really arriving that, that Israel was more willing to talk peace than it had been in preceding years. What we'll see now is a story of peace, or I should say a story of peace frustrated. Famously, in 1978, there were the, the Camp David Accords, and there we see uh, Egyptian, President Sad, uh, uh, Egyptian President Sadat together with uh, President Carter of the USA and the Israeli, uh, the man there on the right-hand side of the picture, the Israeli Prime Minister uh, Manasseh Begin. President Sadat was a, a brave man. Uh, President Sadat risked his life for peace. What he did is he, he held out, as it were, the olive branch to Israel to make peace with them, despite severe opposition from all of the other Arab countries. And the price he paid for these, these efforts at peace, and he went to Israel to actually try to achieve peace, and afterwards to, uh, this is uh, at Camp David in the United States, and afterwards to the United States, to try and, and, and really uh, uh, nut out a lasting peace treaty. Well, that was unsuccessful, and President Sadat paid for it with his life. And he was assassinated not long after uh, this attempt at peace between Israel 
and the Arab nations. The same story continued on into the 1990s. In 1990, uh, we have uh, uh, another Israeli prime minister. Uh, he's there on the left-hand side of that photograph. Uh, president Rabin, you've got another US president, uh, you've got uh, President Clinton, and you've got the, uh, the chairman of the Palestine uh, Liberation Authority, Yasser Arafat. And again, attempts to make peace, but again, those irreconcilable differences that we touched on earlier on are just not able to be unraveled. It's, it's a Gordian knot that you cannot get loose. You just cannot arrive at, at a lasting peace. So again, the 1993 Oslo Accords were a failure. The result? Continued conflict. It's really just a history of conflict. It's really 70 years of conflict. So into the 1990s and, and into the, the new millennium, into the, the millennium that, that we live and breathe in now, you have the, uh, the Palestinian Intifada, which is a series of, of violent uprisings uh, against the Israeli state. And in the background, you've got these entities like uh, the PLO originally, and they've now sort of morphed into Hezbollah and Hamas. Hamas are in the old parts along the, the western coast uh, that were controlled long ago by uh, uh, their ancestors, Palestinian Arabs. And you've got Hezbollah in the north. Uh, you've got them in Lebanon. And they're controlled by other entities. They're controlled, as it were, by other powers. They're, they're just proxies in this, this continual conflict. Well, the sticking points today. After all of this time, are pretty much the same sticking points that they were 70 years ago. On the Israeli side, uh, Jerusalem has to be their capital. Recently, we saw that uh, the United States of America has moved its embassy to Jerusalem. Uh, they've recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. And as you've seen in, in the news recently, there's been outrage reaction against that uh, from the Palestinian side because the Palestinians want Jerusalem to be the capital of their country, the capital of Palestine. As far as all of those refugees, remember there were 700 refugees back in 1949. And there are many more uh, descendants of those 700 refugees, 700,000 refugees now. As far as the Israelis are concerned, uh, they should be resettled in other countries, including some perhaps in, in a future uh, state of Palestine. As far as the Palestinians are concerned, all of the descendants of those refugees from 1949, from Al-Nakba, are to be returned to Palestine and Israel, whatever is left of Israel. And that's really the point, because as far as, as the Palestinians are concerned, they want the state of Palestine but they don't really want to recognize any part of that country that is now Israel as an Israeli state. So we have the same tensions, the same irreconcilable differences today as we had in 1949. Let's just look at a, a famous photograph. It's really regarded as somewhat of an icon. This is a photograph from 1967. And uh, there's three Israeli paratroopers, and they're standing by the, the remains of the great temple that once existed in Jerusalem in the times of Jesus Christ. And they're standing there, and they've just captured uh, that historic heartland that is Jerusalem, that is uh, part of, of what they regard as their capital city. And it's a very emotional time, and, and you can see that... that they now believe, these guys, that, that, that they've made Jerusalem and Israel secure. Nevertheless, it's still isolated. It's still not safe. The cartoon was drawn of those three men in that famous photograph in 1967. And the text that's given to uh, these three men is one of them saying, the one on the left is saying, well, what a victory! We have all of Jerusalem now! And the man in the middle is saying, and the West Bank, and the Gaza Strip, and we've got the Golan Heights too. And the one on the right saying, future generations will remember this moment in 1967 as the juncture at which all of Israel's problems are solved. Well, there's an irony there, isn't it? And it's meant to be an ironic cartoon, because we well know that even though Israel captured these new territories and took control of the whole of Jerusalem in 1967, Israel's, problem, Israel's problems are not all solved. So there we are today, 
We've got those same three paratroopers, and they've grown a little older now, as we do. And they're still in the same country. It's still secure, but increasingly isolated, perhaps more so today than it was in 1967. Modern Israel, really, is seen as a pariah state by many people across the world, much more so now than I've ever seen it in my life. And I can remember Israel when I was a little boy back in the 1960s. And I remember Israel then was viewed very differently. It was sort of viewed as a, as a David in the David and Goliath story, where, you know, the small nation triumphs over the bigger power. It was really seen by much of the world in a much more sympathetic light than it is today. But today, Israel is seen by many as a pariah state. And Israel is still surrounded and opposed by unappeasable enemies, enemies that don't really want peace. And Israel re remains always in a state of never-ending siege. So not much has changed since 1949. Israel's become stronger. It's a great power. It's the greatest military power in the Middle East. But it's under never-ending siege. Now, my perspective on all of this is a biblical perspective. As a historian, I believe that the, the, the most reliable history on what's happening in the Middle East can be gleaned from the Bible. And we'll come back to that in a moment. But before we do, I'd like to tell you a story. That's a story of this lady here, Golda Meir. Golda Meir was uh, one of the most uh, uh, resolute and powerful prime ministers amongst all the prime ministers of Israel. She was prime minister back in the 1970s. An amazing lady, a very strong lady. Uh, a Russian Jewess originally that... Uh, just before you yep. go on to that story, sorry to interrupt the story. Uh, question from the audience, can you define what a pariah state is? Thanks. Uh, a pariah state is, is a state that is uh, not regarded as being an acceptable state by other countries. A pariah state is an outcast state. Uh, a state that is just not acceptable as being part of the, the family of the nations of the world. So a pariah state. So here's Golda Meir, and she was the prime minister of, uh, of this pariah state in the 1970s. Uh, during the Yom Kippur War, she was prime minister, or just after that. And uh, a really interesting thing happened to Golda Meir, uh, back in 1948, so when Israel first became an independent nation, when Israel was, was reborn in 1948, she was the, the first Israeli ambassador to Moscow, to the USSR, to the Soviet Union, to communist Russia, one of the great powers of the world in 1948. In 1948. So she went to Russia as the, the first ambassador. And when she was in Russia, she took time out and she went to the great synagogue in Moscow. And there's a picture of it here. Uh, the Moscow Choral Synagogue, the great center of Russia's Jews. And Russia had and still has a substantial Jewish population, but then it had uh, probably the biggest Jewish population outside of Israel. So she went to this, this synagogue in 1948, one evening, just to meet some Russian Jews. And to her enormous surprise, she didn't just meet a few at the synagogue. There were tens of thousands of Russian Jews that attended that evening at the synagogue. They came because they were overjoyed that at last Israel had become a sovereign state. At last the Jews had their own homeland. And so there were tens of thousands of celebrating and wildly emotional Russian Jews. And you can see that Golda Meir, circled there, is in the middle of this, this vast crowd of Jews. And they were saying to her, Golda, this is wonderful news, in, in Yiddish, of course, which is the, the, the language of the Jews of Eastern Europe. And she understood Yiddish because she came from Russia. And they were saying, this is just wonderful that's happened. Israel, at last we have Israel. This is such great news. We've prayed for this all our lives. Our ancestors prayed for this moment. And now at last, Israel is a Jewish state. And all she could think of saying back to them, as they swarmed around her, effusive, emotional, all she could think of saying was this in Yiddish. Ich danke euch, was ihr hot gebleiben jeden. Now I'm sure you don't know what that means. I don't either. Until I get a translation, that is. What she said was, 
thank you for remaining Jewish. That's all she could think of saying. Thank you for having remained Jews. It's so wonderful that through these ages that you've lived here in Russia, that you've remained Jews. Thank you for remaining Jews. And she said it over and over again to the Russian Jews as they milled around her that evening at the synagogue in Moscow. Now that's a really interesting thing that she said to those, those Jews of Russia. Thank you for having remained Jews. Thank you that you've stayed Jewish. Well, I think that what Golda Meir said begs some questions. And I'd like to ask those questions now. Thank you for having remained Jews. How did they actually retain their identity? They were outcasts for almost 2,000 years in spread around the, the, the different countries of Europe and the Middle East. How did the Jews manage to retain their identity? Thank you for remaining Jews. Well, how did you do it over 2,000 years? Why weren't the Jews assimilated in all of those foreign countries where they lived? Why weren't they assimilated and absorbed? It's happened to every other nationality that has been conquered and absorbed. They've been assimilated, and after a while, they don't exist anymore. So why weren't the Jews assimilated over this long period of time that they didn't have their own country? How did they survive almost 2,000 years of hatred and prejudice Persecution in so many of the countries where they lived. The persecution of the Jewish people is unlike any persecution that I've ever read about. It's quite astonishing. It happened in the, the, the nations of Europe in the Middle Ages. It happened all over. In pretty well every country where they lived, at some time or another, the Jewish people, always a minority, were persecuted for being Jews. So how did they survive those hundreds and hundreds of years of persecution as foreigners in someone else's country? Was it entirely through their own efforts that they remained Jews? Was it because they were so strong in their Jewishness that they survived as Jews for nearly 2,000 years? Well, more questions. It is really a miracle that they survived as, as a people, as a distinct people. And did they themselves bring about this miracle of their own survival over a period of almost 2,000 years without a homeland? What about Israel? How did this, this ancient domain of the Jews, where they once lived, how did it come to be reestablished nearly 2,000 years after it was swept off the map by the armies of Rome in 70 AD and again in the year 130? There was no Jewish state then. How did it come to be reestablished almost 2,000 years afterwards? These are huge questions. And I would suggest they're questions that I can't give an historically based answer to. So, what it all boils down to is why does Israel actually exist? And for who does it exist? Because nothing like this has ever happened before where a displaced people survive over hundreds and hundreds of years and re-establish themselves in the country where they were expelled from nearly 2,000 years ago. It's never happened before. Well, I think we have to go to the scriptures. If we ask the question, how can history teach us what the answers are, I have no answers. But if we look at it from a different perspective, and we ask ourselves, well, what connection does all this history have with the Bible? Is there a, a perspective that we can glean from the scriptures on all of this that has happened? I think there is. The book of the Bible is full of prophecies. And a lot of them are very ancient. They go back into the Old Testament, into the first part of the Bible. I'll give you some of them. The first one is from the New Testament, however. And it's the voice of Paul speaking to us about Israel. And he says, and he writes this in his letter to the Romans, he says, and in this way, all Israel will be saved. So he's writing this now in the first century. And he's saying, all Israel will be saved. And then he quotes the Old Testament. As it is written, 
the deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob, that's the people of Israel, and this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So what Paul is doing here is he's quoting the voice of God. So Israel, Jacob, is going to have their covenant restored when they become God's people once again, when I take away their sins. Interesting. There's more. What about this kingdom that, that, that is being uh, uh, spoken about in the Scriptures? There is a kingdom, a future kingdom, that is spoken about in the Scriptures. And it's really a unique kingdom. It's an unprecedented kingdom. Let's just see what the, the prophet Daniel said uh, some 500 years before the time of Jesus. He said that the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. This is in Daniel chapter 2. Nor shall the kingdom be left to other people. And it will break in pieces all the kingdoms and bring them to an end. But that kingdom of which Daniel speaks, it shall stand forever. So the, the Bible prophesies about a kingdom that will stand forever. A future kingdom. Future then and still future today. What about that kingdom? What about the ruler of that kingdom? How is it going to be ruled? Well, there's going to be a king one day, according to the scriptures, in restored Israel, that is going to be in the line of Israel's greatest king, King David, who lived about a thousand years before the time of Jesus. And that king that is in his line, who will come, he will be great. It's quoted in Luke, the time of the birth of Jesus. That king that will become in David's line will be great, and he shall be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to that coming king the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob, in other words, over Israel, over the people of Israel, and of his kingdom there will be no end. So we've got this same continuation of this theme of an endless kingdom ruled over by a king this time, we understand, in the line of David. What about this? It's talking about Jesus. The last book of the scriptures, Revelation, talks about this kingdom on earth, centered in Jerusalem actually, ruled over by God's son. God's son, the descendant of David. And the time will come, according to Revelation, when the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, of Jesus. And he shall reign. That's the Lord's Christ, Jesus. He shall reign forever and ever. So ladies and gentlemen and young people, I'm going to close really on this, this powerful theme. And it's a theme that runs right through the Bible. It's a theme that's, that's commonly known as the hope of Israel. And I've written it there in, in the Hebrew language from the Old Testament. Uh, it's a theme that runs through the Bible. And it's about the deliverance of God's ancient people and the restoration of God's ancient people and the time to come when Israel will be a permanent kingdom that is ruled over by Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Thanks, Richard. Thank you. Um, a question for you. And again, it's just like my question to Jeff. There's not a yes or no answer. Um, so that information... Uh, from both presenters is, is fascinating. Historically, it's, it's fascinating. But what do we do with it tomorrow and the next day? Um, uh, m my thought in this is that uh, when I speak to people about this stuff, either directly speaking to people to work or um, there's a couple of news feeds I follow on Twitter about events in Israel and the Middle East, the, the continuation of what Phil's been talking about, the ongoing conflict, and in whether it's people at work talking to me or whether it's comments on the Twitter feed or whatever it is, most people fall clearly into one side or the other. They support Israel politically or they support uh, the Arabs or the Palestinians politically. Now, if we take all this information out of the equation and we, just, we take God out of the equation, we take the Bible out of the equation, there's really just three positions that people can take. It's either they say, yes, Israel has the right to the land or yes, the Palestinians have the right to the land, or they just detach and be neutral. As a, once we take this information on board, is there a fourth position? Where do, our, where do our heads sit with this, and where do our, where do our, or where do your emotions 
come from when you're reconciling? You're seeing the tragedy of human events, but it's also part of the coming of the kingdom of God. Like, I don't know. Yeah. Comment on that? Yeah, I, I do have a comment on that, Richard. I think that, that you, you are right to say that there is a tragedy of events. And we've seen just a bit of the tragedy of events that's been happening ever since the Jews started to return to their ancient homeland that was Palestine and has now become Israel. Uh, the story of tragedy on both sides, on the Palestinian Arab side and on the side of the, the Jews, the Israelis, is an immense story of suffering. It's an immense story uh, of rights and wrongs. And I think the fourth position that we need to take is a position that is, uh, a, a position that is not political. Uh, we, we, we need to look at this, I think, through the perspective that I try to introduce my presentation with, which is a Bible-based perspective. And if we leave politics to one side and the rights and the wrongs of, 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 of the Jews and the rights and the wrongs of the Palestinians, if we leave that aside and see what the Bible says, I think that we'll get a, a, a clear picture of what will be, not what could be. What could be is attempts at peace that have never succeeded. But the Bible tells us about a peace that will be lasting and enduring. So what does it mean to me? It means that I can make sense of the turmoil of the Middle East because I can see solutions to it that are, are not of the devising of political parties or the rulers of the world, because they've failed and will continue to fail. But I can see a solution that the Bible promises that actually comes from a, a, a divine source. So that's my take on it. Yeah. How do you balance the emotions that come from that? So when you say we look to what will be, there's like to look towards the kingdom of God, there's excitement, there's longing, but we also know that the Bible tells us there's, there are hard times and there will be hard times for, for human beings, for mothers and fathers and for children. So how, how do you package your emotions as you look towards what will be? Well, as someone, Richard, that, that has looked at the, the history of the 20th century in quite a bit of detail, and particularly the history of uh, the Jewish people in that 20th century, I can't but help to be moved. Uh, I can't but help to be empathetic towards those that I perceive to have suffered so terribly. So my emotions are, are, are stirred by what I know. But even though I feel, feel sorrow and I feel uh, a, a, a sense of hopelessness at the ongoing uh, a strife that I see uh, in the Middle East, which, by the way, reflects the strife that exists all over the world. I can't solve it myself, and I can't see solutions to it myself. I can only live in the hope of what the Bible tells me will happen. So that, to me, is the solution from the misery uh, and from the heartache that exists in the Middle East and, indeed, in the rest of the world. This is a hope of something better to come that the Bible speaks of so authoritatively and so consistently from its first book of Genesis right through to its closing book of Revelation. It's a consistent theme of salvation and something new to come, something in God's plan, something in God's ordering of the world that will happen in stages. And we've seen uh, one important stage of it in the last 70 years in the establishment, against all the odds, of God's ancient people coming as the Bible prophesied they would back to their ancient homeland and re-establishing themselves there. Thanks, Phil. Um, on behalf of everyone here, thank you. And thank you, Jeff, as well, for, for both your presentations um, this afternoon. And thank you, everybody, for coming along and being a part of it. Um, the thought that I was left with is that in an era of, of fake news and paid influences on Twitter and Instagram and other places, that the concept of truth has really been challenged these days. But I, I hope you have seen some appreciation of, of those two truths that I mentioned um, earlier. The truth that God has a plan and the truth that we can trust the Bible. And truth is a powerful thing because when we know something, then we behave in a certain way. Truth drives behaviour. 